Okay, uh, my name is Manu Homer Porten. It's an honor to speak here. I'll try to finish up my presentation in minus 45 minutes so that we are back on time. But, <laughs> Thank um, you, Manu. <laughs> but it's, it's not so unlogical. So I'm a mechanical engineer. So my background in uh, machine learning and deep learning is very, very shallow. And, and so uh, it's only appropriate that I uh, speak a bit shorter. Um, it will be all, also more applied. Uh, so in this talk, I will uh, explain more how, how we use this for advanced proprioceptive sensing of flexible uh, surgical robots. Uh, I have to tell that everything that is uh, presented is not my work. It's uh, work from my PhD students uh, and by uh, my under supervision of uh, my postdoc Mulut Urak. Uh, proprioception is uh, very important. Most of us uh, rely on it heavily. Uh, and this is a guy, is a uh, person, Ian Waterman from UK, who actually lost that uh, sense. So the only thing that he can do to move is he would need to um, watch his uh, feet if he's walking or his hands when he's manipulating. Uh, and so that's a makes that his uh, life becomes much less effective, efficient, and much slower. And so in surgical robotics, we also have systems that do not have uh, proper proprioception. So what is uh, proprioception about? It's a sense of self-movement, force, and body position um, that you find in Wikipedia. And that's actually what uh, is often missing, missing in minimal invasive surgery. So uh, you see here, minimal invasive surgery, you need a camera to observe the environment. And in this case, you can actually see that you're observing that much your environment that uh, you're applying a lot of forces on the environment without knowing it. And so one uh, common uh, side effect of this uh, um, lack of proper reception is that after laparoscopic or robotic surgery, you have a larger um, uh, prevalence of trocar site hernia, just because you're not fully feeling what is going on or paying attention to it. And uh, in uh, the keynote of Bradley Nelson was an application of uh, fetal surgery. There, this is really a big deal there, this lack of proper reception. This, um, Fetal, uh, the fetal surgeons do amazing job saving lives of uh, a lot of uh, fetuses, but in 18.5% uh, of the cases after the successful intervention, due to the fact that they apply this much force on the uterine wall, the uterus breaks. And so you have a preterm uh, delivery and that's also fatal. So proprioception is a big deal. Um, if we're talking about flexible instruments, it's even much more uh, critical because we are not used to understand how a flexible instrument is moving or how to control that. And so these parameters, self-movement, -move force, body post posture, are very hard to get and, and we need to have solutions for that. And so... Since the uh, infrastructure, uh, the structure is so complex, um, even a mechanical engineer as me uh, start doubting, yeah, is model-based still possible in, in, in controlling this complexity? And how could learning help? And so obviously we have a distributed system, so we need some distributed sensing, but as, as you will uh, find out in the next slide, we do need some intelligent processing of it. So we cannot just throw everything in a network. What we use most of the time is FBGs, fiber break gratings. So very small optical fibers, 250 microns, uh, that can be easily integrated in an instrument and that uh, in which you send in light. And then if you stretch uh, the fiber, then the light is going to be reflected at a reflector and you can hence measure the stretch in this fiber online. Uh, and then if you have a number of those fibers, you can use them to assess the bending direction or the bending angle 
uh, and the amount of bending. This is, you can have three separate fibers or you have actually a single fiber where you have multiple cores in there. And so you use that to measure the strain in these different fibers. And then you can use it to, uh, if you have three of those, you measure the curvature and measure the bending plane. And so this works pretty well. Here you see um, this um, in a three millimeter catheter uh, integrated in real time, you can uh, follow that shape. However, if you really want to have good precision, which is the case in uh, medical, then there are some issues. And one is the fact that you have like in such a fiber, a number of these lined up sequentially. And if you have an error here, then this will be augmented and build up and integrated until the end. So you will have to reconstruct that and every error is gonna be amplified to the end. And so you want typically to control your end very precisely. And so you need to solve that issue of errors and integration thereof. And another point is twist. Uh, these uh, fibers are not uh, very well able to distinguish bending from twist. And so you can design your system that is free of twist, but in general, it's very difficult to ensure that. So you need some solutions for that. So for the first part where I indicated we want to reduce the error at each of these fibers maximally, so that if we integrate, we still have a good uh, resolution at the tip. Well, one key element is the calibration of the fiber. So it's very important to know what is the distance between these typical um, between these optical cores, what is the spacing and the angle and your manufacturer gives you some values, but that is a standard value and it's, and you actually need to de determine that for each fiber. And often your fiber is not in the center of your instrument. So you actually would also need to know where is this fiber with respect to the center of my instrument, because it's the center line of your instrument that you're gonna try to reconstruct. So these parameters, DF and theta F, that's also something that you need to determine. And in principle, that can vary over the length of your catheter, let's say. And so if you have a, a, a constant value for that, you may get into trouble. So you, these are all aspects you have to take into account. And so uh, what we uh, initially tried is a traditional approach, trying to identify all these parameters one by one. Uh, that's time consuming. And um, because of that, our uh, PhDs were more interested to just throw it in a network. Uh, they train, do a lot of ex uh, examples and the network does the uh, calibration of these parameters. And so uh, in this case, we actually have, we don't have to make assumptions on the geometry and we are actually estimating more or less constant parameters over the time. So we can assume that these geometric parameters do not change. Uh, and so then this makes perfect sense to us. And so we got uh, very excellent results by uh, doing that. Here you see these fibers and we are measuring the tip position error, uh, bending these uh, systems, uh, making different kind of trajectories and uh, having errors below um, one millimeter, let's say. Another point, a challenge is the twist that I indicated. We did that uh, approach here on this fiber. You see here in uh, green, the method that we are um, using to, uh, that, we, that we developed before and in red is uh, our new method. But so you, we train that system for one uh, half of the workspace. And then if we go to the other half, we can kind of see that all of a sudden the performance drops dramatically. And that's because if we're going over the center line, somehow there is a twist on this fiber inside of our catheter and these parameters are not captured. So um, what we uh, then uh, developed is we augmented the um, description of our strains that we have. They are not only the temporal actual uh, temperature actual and then the bending strains but also a, a, a twist uh, parameter and we assume that this parameter can be estimated uh, and so we estimate that uh, so far our only solution for solving twist is using an other sensor that can be any kind of sensor but in this case we use fluoroscopy to kind of estimate these uh, twist parameters at certain shots in the time. So we don't need, here you see our setup. 
And here you see our uh, results whereby we have uh, very infrequent fluoroscopy shots just to estimate this twist parameter. And by doing so, we can actually improve our um, um, estimation accuracy uh, significantly in a, a clinical setting, because this was done uh, in vivo on an uh, animal. So um, that's about uh, motion. So with shape sensing, we can get pretty far. Uh, we're also interested to know forces, what is playing and how can we understand uh, what kind of forces are acting and how to uh, deal with that. Uh, so here you see an example. We have a catheter inside of a vas vasculature. There is no way that you will not have contact with your vasculature. So how do you determine where it makes contact, contact and how you can use that for improving your steering? Uh, you, you are not interested to apply too large forces uh, at a certain place where there is, for example, calcium or a plaque because that may dislodge and get into your brain. So you want to understand these locations and amplitudes of forces. So here uh, we also considered deep learning um, and LSTMs. This is some work from D. Why we, we uh, consider that? Well, we had some great results with controlling here a steerable catheter full of friction uh, and with a rate dependent friction. So depending on the bandwidth, the friction varies. So we, we could not really properly model that and we had uh, these uh, LSTM networks that were able to do that perfectly. So we, we thought, okay, let's use that now and let's use that in a situation where we have contact and let's try to control this new uh, system, uh, train for the contact. And uh, we were able to show very nice that we can actually move our catheter with a certain contact assuming that we know where the contact is. That's the second part of the, uh, the, the talk. But then uh, we actually realized that depending on the location of the contact, these uh, methods do not generalize well. So we had to train one for this location if the contact would be here at the tip or one centimeter lower and two centimeter lower. And then if it's at the other side and then if the contact is not here at one centimeter, but it's actually only if you bend 1.5 centimeter. So we figured out this method is very, very um, impractical. So um, this is uh, something that we learned. So you cannot uh, apply it for everything. But if you are uh, a little bit, uh, I don't, I, sh I don't, it's, uh, if my, my student is a little bit smarter than that. So he found that actually what we can do is we can actually just train the free space model of this steerable catheter with a network perfectly. And then we just use all the deviations from that and uh, interpret that as contacts. So that was a talk, talk that was uh, introduced yesterday. So here you see actually our uh, catheter. Um, we are training in our free space models for this section, suggest that uh, the tip should be here. For this se section, it suggests the tips should be here. And then here for this section, it suggests the tip should be here. So this is all this um, uh, model that ex explains that. But then here, if we have a contact, then because of the contact, this deformation is gonna be different. And so we, we will end up with a different position here from the expected one. And so by looking at this anomaly, this difference and having just a simple single uh, neural network, we can actually now solve the complex problem of uh, forces at different locations. Here, this is a, a video of how that works. So we have like um, the uh, real contact is in, uh, the ground fruit is in green and, and then in blue and in red, we, we have two uh, ways that we uh, show how we estimate the location of the contact, and you can see that this fairly well uh, estimated. The location is interesting, but also the force is interesting. For that, uh, so far, we just use the model-based method. Uh, this is a talk also that was uh, discussed by uh, Vincent Alloy, 
uh, of the group of um, uh, Rucker yesterday. It was an expansion of, of, of work that we did before, and that was an extension of their work. But so basically what we do is we have like a Kalman filter and in the filter, we're estimating forces and locations where forces are taking place. And so depending on that, we can then apply loads on this system and then our, our filter will indicate here at this point, we have this load, this is the estimated contact load, and this is the uncertain that we have on that load. That works reasonably well. It's uh, for multiple loads. Uh, later work, we use uh, curvature um, to estimate that. Uh, and then you see here how we are loading this uh, beam. Uh, here is a more dynamic experiment. So we have a sensor in there and uh, people are applying forces. And then here you see the forces and the locations of forces along the X axis and the Y axis. And so you can see that depending on where he hits that, we are able to estimate uh, the location and uh, complex uh, forces in both directions, let's say. So overall, it, um, we can find good uses of ML and DL in specific portions of the field uh, for shape, force, and pose. Uh, whether it's a panacea or an alchemy, uh, I think it's case by case. I, we from now on we consider both options i think it's sign uh, we we are coming from a department where normally you would be um, not allowed to continue living if you are this uh, speaking out deep learning uh, but i think it's scientifically uh, valuable to e explore that and compare and uh, learn w which works better when uh, accidentally alchemy can lead to good results uh, but it doesn't generalize well. So in safety critical uh, situations, if we use machine learning, we will always use model based next to it and then use that as a monitor. And so if there is a large discrepancy, then we will inform our clinician and uh, start the safety procedure. Uh, that's uh, what I wanted to tell. Um, I think if there are questions, that's fine, but maybe any quick questions? Yeah, thank you for a very nice talk. And uh, I'm curious about you managed to measure deformation and along with force. And uh, I want to ask, uh, it can be multiple contacts for the future? Or how yeah, do you think? The video was already multiple oh, already? contacts. Oh. Yes, yes. So it it's, can, mm. it's because we have a distributed, we have a fiber break rating with distributed fiber gratings over the length. Mm. And so we can then uh, have multiple contacts because we will have, the curvature will vary at the location where we apply a force, let's say. Okay. A, oh. a, a bit simplified explanation. Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Thank you for the amazing talk, uh, really nice uh, devices. I want to ask like uh, your method for force estimation. Uh, since I'm working with the magnetic uh, catheter sky devices, uh, they are basically torque driven systems. And can we also generalize this system to predicting the torque on the uh, guide wires or catheters? Do you believe? Yeah, I, th I think so. I don't see why it wouldn't be the case. You just need to be able to put in an a very small optical fiber of 250 microns that is very flexible and bendable. We have one PhD that we share with Santana who is working on that. So uh, if you want to publish that, you should just need to be a little bit before faster than him. <laughs> yes. All right, any other quick questions? If there is no other questions, we have an announcement. As you know, we are very behind and I'm so sorry for that. And since we have a few speakers that they need to talk in another actually workshops, we had to cut, like you see the updates over here. So if you don't mind, we can go to a quick break, like five minutes break for coffee and then come back and then we will continue for our other actually uh, talks. And we have a panel discussion at noon. So that's the reason we have to make this change. Sorry about the changes. Let's go for a quick coffee break and then we'll be back. Thank you.